There used to be this critique of the pornography industry that it was like a patriarchal thing where men controlled women or whatever. Yes. Well, OnlyFans has completely erased that. Now nice. women can do what the fuck ever they want yes. and they can get as nasty or this or they can do whatever they want and there's no patriarchal dominance whatsoever. And then there's all these men out there and I think it's mostly just your average dude who's just like bored and lonely and he's gonna We now bring you into the Freud. This podcast is for entertainment only and not intended for medical purposes. Listen at your own risk. Because when, when we first started and saying that if a woman is on OnlyFans that people are going to judge her as a whore, I do think that that's, like you say, that's this puritanical thing. And that puritanical cultural history that we all grow up in has kind of made all of us have like sexuality, insecurity, confusion, and repressed shit that like we all need to work through. And so we all kind of have that need to work through that and wrestle through that and it's kind of confusing and I don't, I don't think any of us really know exactly what the hell we need to do or when we've ever arrived at being cured of our sexual repression or whatever yeah that that makes it almost like there's a question of is this about becoming sexually mature and or like free to really express your sexuality or is it in some way out of a necessity? Because as you as you may or may not have come in contact with, some people do this because they're really poor. And, and a lot of, well, I think a lot of where I live, everyone's so wealthy that we all kind of forget what it's like to be really poor. And I mean, yeah. so poor that you're all living on one person's very meager salary of $20,000 a year and yep. you're trying to you're trying to run a household on that, and then yep. you're you're given this new platform where I was looking at some stats about OnlyFans that the majority of, of accounts only bring home something like hundred and fifty dollars a month, right? So really, yeah, they're really not successful. But then there's a very small percentage at the top that brings home like thirty percent. There's like one percent of accounts, obviously the the ones that everyone looks at. Um, and they're bringing in 30% of all the income and it's a billion dollar industry that, I mean, that I, I saw, I just saw a documentary about this and I was quite surprised to see that they interviewed specific people who are doing it. And there was some women on there who weren't that attractive, who were making 10 grand a month. And so I think the ones who are really successful, it's less how hot they are and more what they're what the content they're putting online is yeah look the content and the pressure to perform for an audience is almost an entirely different question as it's like what imagine the innocence of starting out as a 20 year old just trying to figure like just playing around with well you know facebook they get this many likes and then they outgrow that so and then it's like, well, I guess if you're 20 now, you maybe never were on Facebook. Instead, you're just looking at how many TikTok views your video got. And then you're like, oh my God, let me see this other platform because you heard of this one friend of yours who supposedly posted some stuff, uh, like guys paid her to put pictures of her feet or her nose on there. This is the shit that I've heard, right? Where <laughs> it's... And people will brag, yeah, yeah, I got paid fifty dollars for a picture of my nose, and it sounds, it starts out <laughs> innocent like that, and then very quickly they're like, oh, well, let me just put a, a, a little nipple pick, and, and here's a little beaver shot, and next thing you know, it's like, well, how, how does this? This is something I was really wondering about, it, because we are psychologists, and it makes a lot of, of sense to start thinking, well, how does one psyche naturally go from from a restricted conservative place to a much more expansive uh including all the all the potentials but well yeah i think when you're a psychologist and actually working with people you realize i believe this is my experience is you realize that there's part there's this this region in the psyche of pretty much every human that has this like sexual fixated thing and if a person starts to indulge that and go into it they start to find 
weird stuff. Yeah. And I guess I'm of the belief that that's normal. Most people have that. A lot of people don't ever want to go look into that dark corner. Yeah. But if you do, there's weird stuff in there. And I'm be- and I believe that and that's and it's actually good to look in there and go spend some time in there. And it's only really pathological if it sucks you in and you sort of lose your balance and you lose control and you start and it starts to affect your lifestyle. Then that's problematic. But if you can just dip your if you can just spend, you know, one hour a week going and exploring that, I kind of don't care how crazy it gets. Like, it's fine to explore that. Well, you just kind of made the concept of posting pictures of yourself naked or masturbating or whatever people are going to pay for on OnlyFans. I'm also now regretting not getting my own account on OnlyFans and then checking out what the hell is on there. Yeah, see if there's any good sheep porn on there. (laughs) Yeah, I want to see, hey, can I at least see some ladies dressed up as sheep? Like, how far does the, how, like, what is really going on there? And I'm sad that I didn't, but okay. I know, I can't, I didn't either. I can't believe that neither of us have did a little like firsthand research into this. It's silly that it's silly. We'll have to come back to this topic after because it's okay. You and I have had enough experience talking to real people because yeah. on, on OnlyFans you don't get to sit there and have them talk for real. And if you hear people, OnlyFans people have well, <laughs> like they're a type of person, um, but they will openly talk about it on podcasts and interviews and stuff and. It just goes into this this very public persona, which is very different than what you see in a psychotherapy office, right? The public persona of somebody who's willing to get on this, it, it sounds very much just like you're listening to um, porn stars or strippers, which, yep. you know, if you if you talk to them in, in their public persona versus behind the scenes, then you hear something really different about what their concerns are as opposed to like it very quickly becomes a, a concern about well how long can I do this I'm I'm already 30 like I have to get my I need a new plan that really quickly becomes the concern is like wow I'm succeeding at this what'll be my next thing yep totally right it kind of well, there's there's a clear like starting point in one's journey as an exploration and then a, a psychic evolution and and then it goes that then my question is like where does this go yeah yeah right, right? that's a good question i let me let me attempt to put this into a, a broader historical context because i think the question you're asking is a pretty big question and it's like a his it's like the evolution of the human sexuality question and let me, uh, I've never tried to simplify this, so I'm thinking aloud here, but a long time ago, like thousands of years ago, let's actually, actually, let's even go bigger. Let's go millions of years ago, before there were humans, there was all these animals running around. And as we see when we're at the dog park and we see dogs, um, they just kind of hump everything whenever they feel like it. And this guy humps that guy and this gal humps that guy. And everyone just, it's just like free humping. And it's just no big deal and no one cares. And so sexuality just is like, is on the loose and it's all good and it's all free. And so then we have to assume as evolution happened that apes were like that and that early humans were like that. And and there's this anthropological research that suggests that like, um, like uh, prehistoric tribal humans were like that, that everyone just kind of fucked everyone and like, it, it was all good. Um, but And then at some point, and it sort of seems like when civilization started and when the world religions started, people discovered, ooh, sexuality is super dangerous. So we have to contain this within these religious rules. And generally the rules that started were, um, you know, one man should marry one woman and uh, sex should just be confined to that marital thing. And then in a lot of cultures, um, if the man had the financial means, he could have more than one wife and that was okay. But but the man sort of needed to have the financial means to safely take care of 
his wives and and his wives should only have sex with them and he should only have sex with his wives except in a lot of cultures you could secretly and discreetly have some like extramarital stuff with like prostitutes or at the brothel or stuff but you had to keep it secret and discreet and so that was sort of the rules of sex for you know the past thousand or two thousand years and then in the 60s there was this huge sexual revolution uh in, in America, I don't really know other countries, but I sort of think similar timing, or maybe it started in America in the 60s, I don't know, but it seems like it's sweeping across the world, which is sex, be, because of birth control and because of whatever else, sex and procreation got decoupled from each other. Yeah. And, 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 and increasingly sex got decoupled from marriage and decoupled from religion. And a new chapter of human sexuality, I think, has opened up. And it just opened up like... 50, 60 years ago. And so I think we're just starting a new chapter and we're all like, whoa, yeah. sexuality. Like, wow, what is this world? And we're starting to explore it. And it's a whole crazy, wild, mysterious world. And I don't think that, I think we're just in the early stages of figuring it out. Yeah. And so I think there's that exploration happening. And then there's the like old school kind of like, that's bad. You shouldn't be doing that. Sex should just between be between a husband and a wife for purposes of procreation. So there's a tension between those two camps, I think. But there's there seems to be this irreversible movement towards decoupling sex from religion and from procreation. And it's this new thing, and we're in it. And I, don't, I think, I mean, it's fascinating to me, and I could go on and on on what I think about it, but basically I think we're exploring a whole new thing that's psychology, deep, primitive, um, Darwinian, Freudian sexual instincts, and then also like spiritual, creative, artistic stuff too. And it's just like a fucking giant, fascinating world. Yeah, but so that this that brings us exactly to where, and thanks for that historical context, because now we're at this point of departure again. And it's like, cool, that we are here looking at some impressive expressions of sexuality it's impressive right if you if you can wrap your head around it and then it's like well where does this go how far does it go and we as a society will have to keep up with this kind of idea that school teachers and husband and wives now post their own porn and you can pay to watch it apparently i'm like mad that I didn't go and pay to see this prior to talking. But like, that's a real thing. But then my question is that we run into really weird territory because sexuality starts as soon as you physiologically go through the metamorphosis of puberty. Mm -hmm. You're like, you're not sexually mature. And then uh, there's like this switch that happens. And then one day, whoop, you are a sexual being. You suddenly, it, it kind of happens undercover, your body changes, body changes, and then one, it like, there's a thing that happens in your, in your psychology where, boom, suddenly, it's real, the switch is on, and it's full volume, and it's way before the age of 18 when yep. that's, when that's socially appropriate. So then what the hell is going to happen with that four years of, of, underage people wanting to play this game yep what the what is that i don't know why i just thought of that like well yeah it's it that well and then i mean if we want to make the question even more complicated you're right like when the sex hormones start pumping you know around is like 11 to 12 in girls and like 12 to 14 in boys um a, a, a huge shift happens, but actually there's a lot of sexual curiosity and stuff in children too. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it just has a different feel and it's not as charged and as powerful and all consuming, but it, it becomes pretty all consuming in adolescence. And then you're kind of asking this question, well, what are they gonna do for those years when they're quote not allowed to do it because they're only 15 years old and you're not allowed to do it but it's almost that's not really that different than the question of in religious cultures when you're not allowed to do it before marriage it's kind of the same question well so i don't know if you've had patients that have had this problem but i've had 
I work, I work with a lot of high school age kids and, and or college kids that got in trouble for sending nude pictures to their friends. Totally. And, I've and, had patients the same thing. Right. And, and these kids got really in trouble as if they were um, sex offenders. And, yep. and like, I can't remember the worst case. I think someone was, was on house arrest as a result. Like this, this one young guy had like 30 pictures of naked girls from various schools around here. Mm. And, and it's just, he, he kind of collected them on his phone as each person would send him, Oh my God, look at this one. Look at that one. Right. Yep. And, and then it was like, he was somehow, um, guilty of child pornography and, oh. and because he did on his phone have child pornography. Right. But it was like he innocently acquired it just exploring like, hey, I want to see titties. I want to see this thing. Right. And actually, you know what? I never heard of girls getting in trouble for having dick pics. It was only boys who were in trouble because clearly girls would get dick pics on their phone. They just probably yeah. would. Maybe some of them would, but very few would actually store them and, and be like, oh, I have like 20 dick pics. Yeah. Right. Well, but they're on their phone. If a guy texts a girl a dick pic, it's very likely still on her phone. And if 12 different guys text a girl dick pics, she very likely has dick pics of 12 different guys unless she happened to delete them. But some girls don't delete them. And then she's now a child pornographer uh, perpetrator. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Right? And it's such a strange dilemma. But this kind of like leads me... In well, so do you, do you have any kind of idea of where is this go? Because I don't. I'm just kind of like, oh, look at that strange phenomenon. I th I just think that um, we're, and again, it's this historical thing. Starting in the 60s, this new uh, chapter of human sexuality has opened up. And I think we're a long way from figuring it out because... From one perspective, it's like, so what, like, 16-year-olds, like, want to look at each other's parts? Like, big deal, you know? It's like, yeah. what could be more natural than that? And again, you go back to the dog park, and all the dogs are sniffing each other's crotches left and right. It's just like a normal, natural thing. Yeah. And so 16-year-olds want to look at boobies or want to look at dicks, and they send each other pictures of them. It just feels like big fucking deal. But... Then on the other hand, there's this puritanical history we have where it's like, well, if you do that, you're going to be labeled a whore or a pervert or a whatever. So you yeah. have to learn how to play the game of the culture you're in. And but I, I think if we if you if we ask the question you're asking, which is a good question, is like, where does this go? I don't know, man. Let's like it's like, what should the rules be? Should like. 16 year olds get to just send each other as many dick pics and titty shots as they want i'm not quite ready to embrace that yeah. but should they be arrested for having them no that's kind of <laughs> silly you know yeah, yeah. and sh and should every day at lunch should they all get to go into a room and have a giant orgy no i don't think they probably should do that but should they be like arrested if they're caught in the bathroom touching each other's parts no i mean so it's i, th I think we got i think our rules have to change and i think it'll slowly evolve and i, I dude honestly i don't know right it kind of leads to this okay when you're because we're talking about kids and then it seems like well what are their parents doing like isn't it their parents' job? Because it's not society's job. We can't come up with some kind of law, rule. It's not the school's job. It's the parents are supposed to somehow figure this out. And they don't have a fucking clue. From my experience, no. parents don't have a clue how to talk to their kids about sexuality. I will definitely talk to my son about it in a way where he, he will likely know what he's doing if he sends dick pics and, like, as he's storing pictures of titties like i want to inform him like hey dude <laughs> as as much as that may be a good idea here's here's the ins and outs right yep. but like what do you think the dilemma would be like for parents to try to educate 
I just can't even imagine how this is going to work, that parents are somehow going to be involved enough to, I mean, parents can't even help their kids and reduce their screen time and play less video games. What the fuck no. is going on with parents? No. Well, because parents, <laughs> the reason is because is humans are so fucked up that <laughs> parents are like so fucked up and parents are so consumed in all their neurotic suffering and being lost in life and trying to figure out what they want to do in life and trying to figure out their fucked up relational sexual clusterfuck that everyone's in. So they're so consumed with all that. They don't have the time or space or equanimity to turn and guide their kids through it. You know, I mean, my parents, my parents, who I think are better than average. Like they didn't provide any guidance on any of this stuff for me ever. And they wouldn't even know if I did my homework or not, you know, much less be able to guide me through this. <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Very, yeah, that's a really good point. Because and that, maybe if if we use my historical thing, maybe the first generations in the 60s, they were the most confused. And maybe each generation actually gets less and less confused. So actually maybe the parents are not even that good at helping their kids uh, navigate this. Oh. Well, okay. Speaking of parents and kids, a lot of times when you hear about strippers and porn stars... And now we're, we're just lumping in the average high school kid that wants to send titty pics and dick pics. Like, do you know, is there any psychological validity to daddy issues? Or, and we, and we meant to say, <laughs> That's a good question, dude. Because I mean, someone asked me this the other day. And I, and I, was, and I sat there going through like, like Freud's concepts. In a, and I'm like, but I, don't, I, want to, I want to hear what your reaction is. What, what, is there any basis for that? And if there is, what are they talk? what are people alluding to when, when they think that people strip and become porn stars because of daddy issues? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do think there is some validity to that, but I think different people use that term in different ways. So it's kind of confusing. Yeah. Um, and that, and why is why why are daddy issues kind of hot and mommy issues are not hot? <laughs> no, 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 what is the deal? Why is that? Right? Isn't that isn't that funny? Okay, so let's let's think aloud here and attempt to describe what daddy issues are. Well, well, first off, there's there can be different types of daddy issues. Clearly, so we have to we have to be clear about that. But the, I think the most common one, which I do think is a thing, is um, here, here's just one. I'm not trying to say this is the only one, but here's, I think, a common one that I think is true. Imagine a little girl, like a little toddler girl. She's growing up, and her dad's not around a lot, and he's not really there giving her love uh, for who she is. Like, ideally, all children, their parents should just adore them as, like, beautiful human beings. And then they sort of internalize... I'm lovable as a human. Yeah. Okay, but so now imagine a girl who doesn't get that, and she specifically isn't getting that from her dad, um, and she's kind of hungry for it, and she's kind of starving for it. And then fast forward, and now she's in junior high or high school, and she discovers, oh, wow, if I wear a short skirt, boys give me attention. And like that feels good because I've been starved for male attention my whole childhood and I've never got it. And now I can get male attention. And it's pretty fucking easy to get male attention. All I got to do is wear a short skirt. And she discovers that when she's like 12, you know, and she's eighth grade and she takes a visit to the high school and like all these high school dudes are giving her all this attention. She's like, "Ooh, that feels good. I'm going to get more of that. And fast forward, she becomes addicted to getting this male attention through being seductive and then now she's 17 and she's got this older guy who's giving her the attention and they're fooling around and they're having sex and she's like oh daddy 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 and that that daddy call comes out because somewhere in her conscious her unconscious she's like looking for dad to love her but she didn't get it in the way that she's supposed to. So now she's getting this love and male attention through the sexual way. And then when she's getting it in her unconscious, she's transmuting the sexual love into like 
fatherly love or something. I think that's a, I think that's the fairly common, most stereotypical one. That was actually creepier when you, when you actually express the whole thing verbally, right? Yeah. It, in, in, in my mind, I was like, yeah, yeah. It's so strange that I just put a shortcut or, or a place marker, a placemat where I was like, oh yeah, daddy issues. That's something where, where girls have something going on with their dad and th there's an absent dad and somehow that comes out as a need for sexual, uh, sexual voyeurism. Yeah. And it, it's like, once you put it in that, in the very explicit terms, it's like, whoa, that is it. But so why is that creepy? Why is that creepy? It's because... If you looked at it as far as like, well, how do people get depression or an anxiety disorder? Well, it's very fucking similar, right? Like, oh, you, at, as you think in a very concrete and, and limited way, but the entire world and yourself is evolving, you, you will develop symptoms of anxiety and depression, potentially, this is one theory, as a result of your life is super restricted compared to the ultimate potential that you have. So then the symptoms burst out as this loud announcement that, hey, your plan and your view is trash. Mm -hmm. you, need to fix, you need to fix that. But so yeah. if that doesn't sound very creepy. Well, to me, it seems entirely normal because I, I talk to people all day who are, who are coming in and unraveling this. So my, my theory about the onset of anxiety and depression seems very similar to the onset of these daddy issues. They start totally. very early on. People told you you were going to be this, this specific type of a human being, but as you evolve, it turns out, oh no, you're actually much more than you're different. And so there's a need to break out of that confinement of, of an identity. And that, and that, and if you don't break out of it, then you start to cr be crushed into a depressed state. And so, um, I don't even know if there's any validity to that concept. It just, that, that's kind of like been an unconscious thing in my mind as a result of seeing people resolve these issues endlessly. Right? Yeah, totally. Do, do you, do you jive with, with this kind of, uh, um, understanding? Like, yeah, totally. Total. I mean, I kind of think that everything, like all of our personalities are pretty significantly shaped by this general model, you know. There's like early in life, various forces shape us and there's emotional experiences or unmet needs or all these things and they shape us and then our personalities are just kind of shaped by this and it's almost, if, if it's, what were you saying, creepy, the people would think of daddy issues as creepy and then they would think of anxiety and depression as like wounded or neurotic or pathological. I just think that all of our personalities are fairly, have fairly significant themes of creepiness and woundedness and pathologicalness and neuroticness, you know? Okay. Okay. Well, if we were to bring this back to the, to the subject at hand, which is only fans, then what what do you think are the potential risks for um i guess the more that you maybe expand into the unlimited expression i think well at at some point there was i i noticed an article that said certain content certain sexual content was going to be restricted from only fans that's right. I remember hearing that a few months ago. Yeah, I don't know what they were talking about, but so I'm just assuming that you could do pretty much whatever you want, but I know there's some limitations. But then one of the things that I thought of was what about the risk for inflation of your, of your psychology? Like where you would think that you're hotter than you are, you think that you're worth more than you actually are, just because it's like you're getting actual money from and you're maybe not even that attractive as you pointed out earlier right like you're not that attractive but because you have like 20 guys paying you a certain amount every month and you think well so let's say it's 200 guys or 2000 so you have 2000 people pay you a certain monthly amount and then you think oh my god i'm this 
hot, awesome thing. But then really when you go out and then try to then date somebody who is of that value that you think you are, you're just shut down. Like, I don't, is, do you think that's a problem or is that made up in my head? Well, a lot of people on podcasts and YouTube are saying that that's a problem. There, a lot of people are implying that our current culture where young women um, are getting tons of attention, even just forget OnlyFans, even just on Instagram, but add OnlyFans to it and the money's got to make it worse, where these young women are getting tons of attention from millions of guys. You know, if a young a woman puts up a sexy picture on Instagram, they could, you know, get quickly get tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of likes and tons of dudes then start messaging her, oh, beautiful, you're so amazing. And there's this movement of people that are saying that that's created a generation of kind of divas, kind of women who think that they're queens and that they should be treated by queens and that money should come to them easily and that men should, you know, um, just be kneeling down and praying to them and that it's a it's sort of a psychological and it's not even men you, there's there's a couple youtube channels i can think of where it's women who go around showing women on instagram or women on youtube who are in this diva psychology and showing how absurd they are so it, i don't know i don't know if i want to make a cultural diagnosis but it does seem like there's a generation of women who think they're the shit and are, have like taken this diva queen thing way too far. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see, I have I was unaware of that. It just kind of seemed like I mean Carl Jung argued that this was potentially going to be a problem 100 years ago about adopting eastern philosophy. That eastern mm -hmm. philosophy would be a problem for the western psyche. Can yeah. you imagine that? He was afraid that you would freak out because you might start meditating versus you're going to start. <laughs> he, he had no idea that really what a problem was going to be, that you're going to yeah. see all these like vaginas on on a screen and or you see all of these people pay you money for your silly vagina. Yeah, that, that, that all there's going to be all these women walking around that think their vagina is a god that people should <laughs> pray to and that their vagina entitles them to tons of money <laughs> can, can you no one would have imagined that was going to be a thing no no one would imagine that this is no. going to be a thing because it's so strange that it, it's kind of jumped out of the shadows of those who promote their sexuality from their physical body those are sex workers those are those are the taboo strippers we don't talk about them now it's really come out to uh, people who, I guess they're still in trouble if they try to have normal jobs. But a lot of people that, I, I bet you there's so many normal people on there in those accounts that only average about 150 per month. And then if you're normal, you would very quickly get out of it because you'd be like, oh, the risk is too high. The reward is too yep. low. Yep. There's, a, there's that obvious barrier that one one is... You're not going to stick in there. And so I bet you there's tons of people that just try it and then very quickly are like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did that. I thought I was going to get all the, the sun would shine on my vagina. And yes. it's like, nope, didn't happen. Right. <laughs> the sun did not shine on your vagina. I, I have this reaction and I don't know, maybe this is my pathology. But here's my reaction is I think it's a great thing. Because I kind of am a believer in, like, let's just unleash the full human psyche and all of its nuttiness and nastiness and craziness and beauty and wonder. Let's just, like, unleash it fully and see what happens. And, yeah, it's going to create some messy, crazy stuff. But, like, it'll be cool and exciting. And let's see what's to come. And, it, like, pornography... Or prostitute if por if prostitution and pornography are like of in in a similar thing, I sort of feel like th there's this mo because of the internet and Instagram and OnlyFans, there's been this movement of pornography and prostitution to be fully um, 
like now the individual female and males too, but mostly females, the individual female now has full control and full autonomy and she makes the money herself and she gets to call the shots herself and she gets to do whatever she wants. Yeah. And then, and then the men all out there because of the internet, they all get to behave however they want and do whatever. It's like really individually liberated and there's there used to be this critique of the pornography industry that it was like a patriarchal thing where men controlled women or whatever yes well only fans has completely erased that now nice. women can do what the fuck ever they want yes and they can get as nasty or this or they can do whatever they want and there's no patriarchal dominance whatsoever and then there's all these men out there and i think it's mostly just your average dude who's just like bored and lonely and he's gonna like pay the like Thirty-eight ninety-five dollars a month or whatever, and so it's just like a fascinating experiment of what are all these totally liberated, independent individual women gonna do, and what are the men gonna do? And it's just kind of like this cool, interesting experiment. And it's like, all right, let's see what all, let's see what the perverted human race is gonna come up with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. I think that's that's where we should we should wrap this up. Is it my Alrighty. my dog just jumped off the the chair trying to run into the next room. <laughs>